May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector follows last week's gospel reading of the unjust judge and the persistent widow. These two parables are often interpreted side by side because of the apparently shared theme of prayer. The passage that immediately follows today's parable is about the disciples not allowing the children to come to Jesus. And this caused Jesus to rebuke them, saying, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And so the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector fits nicely within the general theme of dependence on God's graciousness rather than relying on self. So while Jesus directs the parable at the Pharisee, Luke seems to have a wider audience in mind, addressing anyone who is vulnerable to pride and self-righteousness as the Pharisee is in today's Gospel reading. Now verse 9 introduces and gives us the context of the parable, stating that Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves and regarded themselves as righteous over others. Now being righteous is an important theme in the Gospel of Luke. For example, Elizabeth and Zechariah were said to be righteous before God. They lived blamelessly according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord. Luke tells us that Simeon was righteous and devout. Also, having witnessed the death of Jesus, the centurion declares, certainly this man was righteous. And then Joseph of Arimathea is described as a good and righteous man. So Luke offers his readers many examples of genuine righteousness. As we can see, these individuals are righteous because they obey God's commandments and completely trust in God's mercy. And so to those who are self-righteous, trusting only in themselves, Jesus declares, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus also says, I have come to call not the righteous, but I have come to call sinners to repentance. And so today's parable depicts two contrasting figures, a Pharisee and a tax collector praying in the temple. Now for Luke again, the temple is a special place of prayer where righteous people and the early disciples went to pray. Now to see a Pharisee in the temple praying was not unusual, but a tax collector praying in the temple is indeed a bit, of, it's a bit odd and also possibly shocking to Jesus' audience. Now, Pharisees often pray. They went to the temple. They placed themselves under the law. They were examples of right behavior. And so they certainly must be trusting God and not themselves. And so it would seem that the Pharisees pray, thanking God that is not like the rest of humanity was not at all unusual. He's actually the model of a pious man, both by what he did, like fasting and tithing, and by what he didn't do, acting like thieves, evil people, adulterers, and tax collectors. And so this Pharisee was apparently beyond reproach. On the other side stands the tax collector. Now again, tax collectors were considered traitors by their fellow Jews. They collected exuberant levies for, for the Romans and for their own profits, money that went into their own pockets. But nevertheless, the tax collector demonstrates a surprising attitude of humility by standing far off and keeping his eyes, eyes lowered. Now, four aspects of the tax collector's humility are briefly indicated by Luke. Luke tells us he stands far off, he kept his eyes lowered, he beat his breast as a sign of repentance, and he cries out to God for mercy. So unlike the Pharisee, the tax collector gives at least some evidence of humility and remorse. He stands apart not because of his worry about defilement, but rather he knows his unworthiness. 
So rather than suggest that he himself is righteous, the tax collector self-identifies with exactly what the Pharisee considered him to be a sinner. So he boasts of nothing before God, but he pleads only for God's mercy. His prayer echoes the opening words of Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God. So nothing more is said of the tax collector's prayer. It is complete as it stands, and nothing more needs to be said of his character. And so Jesus concludes that it is a tax collector and not a Pharisee who goes home justified. For Jesus says, all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Now despite the man's sinfulness, he was made righteous by God. And so this seems like a very simple parable. It feels silly to interpret it when its message is so obvious to us. And yes, there might be the temptation for us to identify ourselves with the tax collector and not the Pharisee. But this parable is a trap. For as soon as you think that a Pharisee is a jerk and place all your identification with a tax collector, then you are the Pharisee. And you say, thank you, O oh God, that I'm not like that Pharisee. That is a trap in itself. The tax collector made no sacrifice, no offering of restitution, but the tax collector was made righteous by God because of his prayer for mercy. And so the trap of this parable is that we are usually about both Pharisee and the tax collector as we move through our lives, whether we realize it or not. And so this trip of the parable is a contradiction because the moment when we see ourselves as sinner or as saint, we are casting judgment and, not in a, and we are not in a right relationship with God. And so the way out of the trip is keep the focus on God, not on ourselves. This parable is not about the Pharisee or the text collector, but rather it's about remembering that God is alive and that God is at work in our lives. And to pray for guidance and grace to love as God would have us love, to love as Christ loved us, and to never be concerned with how we measure up, but rather how we love in a relationship with our brothers and sisters and all of God's creation. And yes, it isn't easy and we will fail, and that is why our confession and absolution is so important. Did you ever really notice the words of the confession? It isn't about rattling off a list of things that we think we got wrong, but it's all about relationships. Almighty God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry. Now it is always about relationship with God, as I said, and with one another. And so while we are busy trying to make things about us, Jesus is reminding us that it is about God alone who justifies. God alone decides who is good enough for the kingdom. Now in our reading from 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith, and from now on there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness. Now at first glance his words sound a lot more like the Pharisee than the tax collector, but Paul speaks about his dependence on God. And so when the author rejoices in the fruits of his faith, he does not claim this righteousness as his own work, or present it as his justification before God. Rather, Paul recognizes his dependence on God. He says, the Lord stood by me and gave me strength. The Lord will rescue me from every evil and save me for his heavenly kingdom. So Paul knows where, that, uh, Paul knows where his righteousness and his hope comes from. They don't come from his own perfection, that is what Paul realizes, nor do they come from self-rejection, as we heard in our gospel reading. But Paul's righteousness and his hope, his life and his life after death, 
and not about him at all. But Paul realizes that it's all about God. And so this morning I pray that this parable will continue to work on us, especially in the weeks to come, reminding us that our wholeness isn't found in comparing ourselves to others, but it is about coming to our awareness that our dependence is on God's grace and on God's love. And I pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.